Did you know that not all women have vaginas? Yes, according to the left, you're transphobic if you don't say that openly on International Women's Day. That and we discuss uh, bodily functions and whether or not those should be spread on your face. I am Elisa Steele. Welcome to Deconstructing the Culture. So before we continue on, I do want to take a quick moment to recognize the grief and tragedy that happened this last week with the multiple terrorist attacks on a couple of mosques in New Zealand. It killed 49 people last I saw and wounded dozens others. Obviously, it doesn't matter what religion we are. It's a tra- tra- it's a complete tragedy when this ever happens. Um, it was it was done by a piece of trash white supremacist, and he, I, I won't name him because as it, it is becoming um, more and more widely spread, the information we have on terrorist attacks and mass shootings, the more we give person that fame and we recognize that person's name and spread that, the more it actually encourages others as their way of infamously going down and making a name for themselves. So I won't name this terrorist, um, but he was a nasty white supremacist and he was obviously in it for the name and the fame, the infamy, because he live streamed it on Facebook and it within the hour after it happened it was everywhere which is really sad and you know I know I know you will have already read about this in the news long before you listen or watch this podcast but I do want to recognize that as you know as people on the outside looking in there's not a whole lot we can do but we can pray for the victims, families, and the victims. And there will be people like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, who will say your prayers aren't worth anything. Well, I don't think that's right. I do think prayer does matter. I do think it's important that we pray for our world and pray for the victims. Prayer is powerful. And not only that, but I think it's disrespectful to the people who did die in this particular circumstance because they were literally lost their life while praying. They were at a mosque, at a religious institution praying. So anyways, my bottom line is, prayer is very important and that is very powerful and that we should pray for our world pray for those families pray for those victims and pray for the hearts and minds of the people around us even if we disagree even if we're not on the same page um so i just wanted to recognize that and moving on to the topics that i had actually planned on talking about this week and on a completely different note let's talk about menstruating I know, I know. If you're a woman, you're just like, lady, I don't need to hear this from you. And if you're a man, you're like, ew, what the heck? Are you serious, Lisa? You're going to talk to me about menstruating? I know. Well, it's the sick internet that's making me talk about this with you. So in the last couple of weeks, it's been a home news story that's been out there. And I actually Instagram stalked this lady and it's 100% accurate. She's a freaking crazy lady. But essentially, this lady, she's a sex coach and she smears menstrual blood on her face in a bid to end the stigma and shame around periods. This is an article by, I'm going to be quoting by the Scottish Sun, and her name is Demextra Nix. She's 26 years old, and she regularly posts selfies to her Instagram page covered in her blood, which she says is, quote, powerful. Now, Dementra I don't know if that's actually how you say her name. It's Dementra. I mean, that's what it looks like to me, but Dementra, I'm just going to call her Demented. She lives in Los Angeles, California. She had her first period at the age of 12, but was ashamed of it and thought it was disgusting. Um, I'm sorry that you were ashamed of it, lady, and I'm sorry that it was disgusting. It's unfortunate that you were in that situation that you didn't have a mom to talk you through it. And I'm going to be straight up with you. There are some cultures and some parts of the world where women are treated differently and they are treated like they're gross and they can't be near. You know, there are some parts of the world where, um, in fact, there's this organization that helps com- combat that. If you actually do care about this kind of thing, which this lady, I think she's just being gross, but there, if you do care about the countries that actually do stigmatize 
you know, women in during their period. It's uh, it's it's an organization called Days for Girls, and they actually go in and they educate women in other countries to how to take care of their bodies, to use feminine products, and you know, in some countries they just go and have some women sit in in a hut, in a menstruating hut, and she sit there while she's on her period and sit on a rock, okay? It's unsanitary and it's gross, and, and we, yes, that is a problem in some countries, but I don't, that's not a country. I mean, that's not a problem we have in this country, and so this lady is is being kind of disgusting by doing this, and, and also, I think if she does want to combat the real problem that is in some countries, because I'm not denying that this isn't a problem in some countries, she's doing it in the wrong way. The right way would be to do what Days for Girls is and going out and educating and giving them sanitary products and then teaching them about their period and why it happens and, you know, how to just take care of yourself. But smear it on your face? No, that's gross and unsanitary. So she lives in California and she was ashamed of it, like I said, then she would, she goes on to say that she would try and hide her period from her boyfriends and worried about bleeding through her clothes. Okay, so I have never tried to hide my period from people I dated or my husband, so that's weird. You have some body issues you need to work through, but I wouldn't do it this way, and as far as being afraid to bleed through, yeah, I'm afraid to bleed through when I'm menstruating on my blankets. You want to know why? because I don't want my blankets and sheets stained. It's very simple. It's the same way if I had a gashing wound on my arm, I would bandage it and I'd be worried about it bleeding through and getting on my blankets at night. It's not because I think some, like, I think my body's gross. It's called sanitary precautions. It's called, that's what you do when your body is <laughs> spewing fluids you take care of it you don't want it leaking through so you're kind of yeah she's crazy anyways so she continues on our society teaches us that periods are dirty and inconvenient well no our society doesn't teach that and actually they are kind of inconvenient have you ever had cramps lady cramps stop me from doing things sometimes because they're very uncomfortable but anyways, then she says, ads about menstrual products talk about smelling fresh or making us cleaner, implying that our body's natural fun functions are gross. No, people advertise about tissue paper too, about feeling fresh, because when you wipe your butt, you want to be fresh and you want to be clean. Would you just go around being like, no, I'm going to wallow in my fecal matter because I can't be like, my body is gross. No, your body's beautiful and you were made a certain way, but it doesn't mean you wallow in your bodily functions. That's gross. It's like a toddler taking off its diaper and playing in its poop. Toddlers do that if you don't stop them. It doesn't mean that just because your body does that, that you're supposed to encourage it. No, <laughs> seriously, lady, it's almost like you need some parental guidance in your tw when you're 26. It's like, you're acting like a toddler and you need someone to tell you, no, that's not what you, that's not what you do with your bodily and functions. So she continues embarrassed and ashamed. She had uh, IUD fitted when she was 20 and after the pill gave her panic attacks and reduced her libido. But the, then the device gave, de, uh, de, I'm going to call her demented, <laughs> demented, heavy, painful periods that left her bed bound. Yeah, I have heard that that's what they do and I wouldn't recommend them, but that's another subject. A year later, she had it removed, blah, 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 started using a menstrual cup when she began and she became more in tune with her cycle. Good for you. I think that's great. You're using a menstrual cup. I mean, the more you can get away from toxins and take care of your body in a healthy, clean way, you go for you, like whatever. Now, a sex coach, she says, sharing pictures of blood on my face and body was just an impulse. I was creating a series to help women connect with their menstrual cycle, and I thought it would be fun. That's gross. Okay. She says that her posts are about liberating women, and vowing she vows to continue posting more graphic photos. Oh, Lord, lady, please don't. Despite the negative comments she receives with people comparing her menstrual blood to poop, she insists that she finds it fun to post the photos. That's gross. You might as well make an Instagram account where you take your fecal matter and paint pictures. It's like, why? No, why? It, no, don't do that. She said, my blood has become, oh, my blood to me has become fun, beautiful, and powerful, and playing with it brings me closer to myself. Oh, Lord, lady. Okay, so next time you have a stomach flu and you start vomiting, are you going to take your throw up and start playing with it because it 
bring you closer to yourself. Oh, Lord, give me a break. Anyways, a common comment she gets is, oh, you should just wipe poop all over your face, and then it's the same thing. Yep, basically, I would make that kind of comment. I mean, actually, I wouldn't because I don't actually have any enjoyment out of harassing people online, so I would just think that comment, but I probably wouldn't make it. She's also heard from family and friends that it was weird and disgusting, and some people don't talk to me because of it. Yeah, your family, you should probably listen to them because they probably love you, and it is weird and kind of gross and unsanitary. It's like giving your, it's like if you had, like I said, a huge wound in your arm that was needed medical attention, let's say, and instead of getting it taken care of and bound up and so it could just naturally take its due process healing or whatever, you're deciding to just play with it and paint yourself with it and Oh, and it's all about not sh being ashamed. You're not ashamed. You're just taking care of your body. It's the same if you have a stomach flu. You're not supposed to be ashamed that you have the stomach flu. It's just part of life sometimes. You take care of it. You don't wallow in it. It's No, uh-uh. Sorry, lady. Anyways, she, to, to conclude, she encourages, she encourages herself daily and some of the weirdos around her to keep posting them and um, that she's going to make She's going to keep doing this until people stop thinking it's weird, which is never. So she's always going to do this. So that's weird. That's gross. End of the story is periods are natural. God did, did make women to, you know, with that bodily function and it serves its purpose. But the same way I wouldn't tell someone to play in their fecal matter or in their vomit, I don't recommend that you play with your menstrual blood because that's gross and unsanitary. and your shock factor to get follows, it might be working, but at the end of the day, you come across as kind of a disturbed person. <laughs> so there you go. Now, let's talk more about the vagina. I know, this is an awkward episode. So on in Women's International History, Women's International Day a couple weeks ago, Deborah Messing, she's an actress, I'd never actually heard of her, but she got eaten alive by her leftist counterpart. She is herself a leftist, but she made these really graphic vagina cupcakes. And she decided that that was empowering to post those. And I was like, all right, lady, whatever floats your boat. They're all different shapes and colors and sizes and all that fun stuff. And um, she decided to post powerful, beautiful, and sweet. And then she adds, after she gets eaten alive by some transgender people who, in case you didn't know, transgender people are, at least transgender women, are men who have a penis and male chromosomes and then have a medical issue and are delusional and they believe that they're female. Well, they decided, them and some various other social justice warriors decided to get on there and call her transphobic because it was Women's International History or Women's International Day. And she only pict posted pictures of vagina cupcakes instead of penis cupcake cupcakes too. Don't you know, men and women, we're not defined by our sexual organs. Don't you know? Don't you know that some women have penises too? Well, she was very promptly informed of that and she had to add i want to apologize to my trans sisters this photo was supposed to be light and sassy the first thing i thought when i saw this photo was wow how wonderful each one is unique in color and shape and size the porn industry has perpetuated this myth of what a beautiful vagina looks like and as a result there are women who feel shame or insecure about the shape of their vulva I love this picture and said every single one is beautiful and unique and powerful blah 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 I did not however think that there are innumerable beautiful unique and powerful women who don't have a vagina and I should have and for that I am so so sorry thank you for writing my wrong so she's crazy and has fully bought into it and I love it when the left eats their own because it's disgusting that she would I mean I, I think it's tacky she posted this picture in the first place but she gets reprimanded for not being woke enough and also side note she is correct about the porn industry making a certain stereotype as to what a female vagina does look like and you've heard me talk about porn I talk about porn all the time and all the reasons why we need to as a society become more educated on the harms of pornography I won't go into that today because if you want to hear more about that I talk about that in a lot of different episodes but that is true. That portion is true. And that is harmful, but 
it's even more harmful outside of the stereotype of what vaginas are supposed to look like. It's even more harmful for her to be perpetuating the delusion and lie that women can have penises too. That's more harmful than a stereotype as to what women's vaginas are supposed to look like. And that's just the truth. And she's delusional as well. So we've got a little bunch of crazy, crazy ladies going around. Okay. Let's go ahead and move into books. Now, this book actually, I feel like is very appropriate. I read this quite some time ago, but I feel like it's very appropriate for today because we are starting to, as the news cycle is moving along, we're starting to talk more and more about the presidential election and what that's gonna look like for 2020. There's a lot of speculation. Is, does Trump have a chance? Will he be elected? Who are, you know, who's going to be the Democrat running? There's a lot of people announcing right now and a lot of, of stories breaking on them, of course, as they eat each other trying to figure out who's going to be top dog. Um, what it comes down to is how the country is going to respond to both policy and also to looks. And I know it sounds shallow, but a lot of the typical American and the typical voter is going to not really do a whole lot of research on who the presidential candidates are and what they actually stand for and what their record is. So a lot of it's going to come down to what do the candidates look like and what is the general image that they come across with. Well, this book called Project President, and it's by Ben Shapiro. Uh, I know many of you are Ben Shapiro fans. It's got 305 pages. It's, it's pretty fairly easy read. It's actually fairly entertaining too. It's kind of a light, more flippant read. It's not, you know, deep philosophy or anything. It's just very entertaining. And it is about presidents and their looks and how many have been tall, how many have been short, how many have had facial hair, how many are more slick, you know, kind of businessman look, how many are the cowboy kind of feel and whether that helps or hurts them, military, whether it helps or hurts them. And there's a lot of interesting stereotypes about what Americans generally go for. And we do judge a lot on looks, unfortunately. That's why I feel like Ted Cruz had a very low chance of getting, even though in the 2016 primaries, I was a Ted Cruz fan, hardcore um, he just didn't have the presidential look that people, a lot of people wanted, unfortunately. Um, and so, so essentially a little short of it is from short, fat, bald John Adams, wig throwing tantrums during the night or during the 1800 election to Abraham Lincoln's decision to grow a beard in 1860 from JFK's choice to forego the fedora in his inauguration to John Kerry's decision to get Botox after the 2004 race. From the golden age of facial hair, 1860 to 1912, to the age of the banker, 1912 to 1960, from Washington's false teeth to George W. Bush's workout regimen, Project President tells the story of America's love affair with presidential looks and appearance. Why what often matters more than a, a, than Politico's position on the issues and what might well be coming next. And he does an interesting breakdown at the end, which is entertaining too. Um, after going through a lot of the different presidents and a lot of the different things that make or break a president's looks to the public, he actually does a breakdown of what he thinks their modern day score would be. And also one of the more entertaining things he talks about is the beer buddy syndrome about like how easygoing a person would be and whether or not like they'd be a cool person to get a beer with. Um, I don't drink alcohol, but I understood like what he was talking about, obviously, and he explains it very well. And that was really interesting, him applying it to the presidents of the past in today's standards of what we would or wouldn't go for. So very entertaining. And if you're into watching the presidential debates and forecasting, you know, who you think is going to make it for the Democrats or not, and you just really are interested in elections, this is a great read for you because it really is entertaining and light while being informative. So there you go, Project President by Ben Shapiro. All right, let's go into movie slash TV show. Today, we're going to go over the TV show Working Moms. It's a show on Netflix, and this show is literally horrific. I can't even tell you how disgusted I am with this show. So first, I'm going to show you a little bit of the trailer, and then we're going to talk about how awful this show is. So HR tells me you have a room to do your milking thing. Yes, this office. I'll put on quite a show. Yeah, I think I'll use the bathroom. Yes, this is Kate. Uh, no, I'm not uh, busy at all. We got the feet. 
Love you. I'm not so sure I want to go back to work. Eight months is not that much time. Soldiers with PTSD are given longer. Are you comparing yourself to a war hero? No, of course not. Right. Childbirth is way harder. Look at my first open house today. I fantasize that a car would just hit me, you know, just take me away from all this. He's talking about a vacation. Yes. Like a brain dev vacation. Day night. I am running just a little bit late. Should I just go home? No, 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 no. Easy does it. All righty there. You get the picture. That was fun. Um, so this trailer doesn't show the worst parts of it. It kind of shows the humorous parts. And I'm not going to lie. There are some very humorous parts of this. Like watching this, I'm not a mom yet, but I have, let's just say, had a lot of experience with children being in such a large family, um, having quite a few siblings, having nephews, um, and nieces and nephews. And let's just say I have more experience with children than the typical uh, adult, especially young adult my age. Um, and so watching some of this, I could definitely compare notes because some of it was funny. And there's this portion where like the, there's this lady instructor telling the, you know, ha instructing the moms through like having the babies do yoga. And one of the moms go, uh, can we just be grown ups and say, and admit that babies don't need yoga. And that's funny because it is true. There's all these random you know, baby fads that are really kind of ridiculous. Babies really don't need yoga. They're very flexible. And if anything, the mamas need yoga. So there were very humorous parts, but mixed in with those humorous parts were some really gross parts, some very disturbing parts, and some very harmful normalizations on top of just pure evilness. So um, let's just start with one character. I'm just going to call her the redheaded character. There's this redheaded character who she has a like nine-year-old, and then she has an eight-month-old. Then she finds out she's pregnant. This isn't all in the first episode. She finds out her pregnant. She's pregnant, and her friend goes, congratulations. And then they sit down for lunch, and she's just like, have you told your husband yet? And she's like, no, I just don't know what he's going to say, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know that I really want this child. And she doesn't say this child. She's like, I don't know that I want this pregnancy or something like that. Like she refuses to refer to it as a child. And then the mom goes, or the other, the friend goes, you know, you have options, right? As in like, you don't have to, you can just abort it. Like, it's no big deal. She, this is a woman who's married in a stable married relationship. She's a therapist and her husband something. It didn't really allude to that very strongly. But you can tell they're middle class, very stable. They have enough money for a full-time nanny to take care of their kids while their mom works from home as a therapist in her home office. Like, you can tell, you can easily tell they are a stable middle class family and she throughout the the next few episodes this redheaded mom continues to call her baby a virus and how mad she doesn't want it and how she like passes out and falls on her stomach and she hopes the baby's hurt and like she's lost the baby and she's disappointed when the doctor says your baby's just fine and in the end she goes to an abortion clinic without her husband just to see what it felt like, as she put it. The husband gets upset, rightfully so. And then in the end, he decides to make a pro and con list about whether or not they should keep the baby, which is disgusting. They make a pro and con list and there's nothing on the pro list except I like little babies. And everything else is they don't have, oh, we don't have enough money. Oh, you know, we don't have time for the children we already have and so and so and so on. And it's so gross. In the end, it shows them happily, hand in hand, walking into the abortion clinic and they get their baby aborted. This is not even like a cry. Like everyone, all, no, everyone, a lot of the leftists, many leftists try and shove the crisis pregnancy in people's face. Oh, you see this girl? She's 15. She was raped. She can't keep this baby. They're normalizing it. So, they're going so far as to normalize a married mom and dad, successful, both of them white collar jobs with a nanny and they're aborting their baby because they don't want it and it will push them too far financially and they don't have time for that baby. You shouldn't be having sex then. You're not going to take the responsibility for the fact that you willingly had sex with each other and the risk of having sex, whether you're using contraceptives or not, there's always a small chance that you will get pregnant. Do not be having sex and you cannot handle the responsibilities of potentially bringing another life into this world. Period. End of story. Married or unmarried, do not have sex unless you are willing to take on those consequences. But if you're just going to kill that child because it's inconvenient to your lifestyle, it's inconvenient to your finances, no, that's 
evil and they totally normalize that not on top of that she normalizes her freaking nine-year-old goes around flashing herself to little boys and being provocative and gross and the principal comes and says your daughter is being provocative we need to talk about this and the mother gets in the principal's face and says how dare you slut shame my daughter and then she turns to her daughter and says don't you let those pricks hold you down you do you girl and it's like are you kidding me you're raising your daughter to be a hoe and that she should do her like you do you girl when she's lifting up her dress to a whole bunch of other little boys how dare you normalize this as being okay this is not okay and that's not slut shaming that's called correcting inappropriate behavior with a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old i can't remember i'm pretty sure she's nine or ten Anyways, it's just, it, that was, that, that was just one mom. They all have dysfunctional relationships. There's the typical, of course, obligatory lesbian couple. There's a lesbian couple and they have like a whole sex scene. I didn't watch it because it was going to make me barf, but they have a whole sex scene where therapists encourage this lesbian couple to have sex in front of their child, which I'm not even going to comment on that, but of course they have to have a lesbian couple. And then um, you know, another lady, she gets super dysfunctional and she talks with her husband about taking a job promotion, but the job promotion makes her move away for three solid months away from her like 10 month old baby. And the husband says, I'm not really basically okay with that and leaving our small son and us for that long. And then the wife goes ahead and takes a promotion behind his back, which shows the most extreme example of a dysfunctional marriage. Like, you're encouraging that and you're supposed to be looking at the husband as the bad guy because he's holding his wife back. He's holding his wife down. How dare he hold her back from, from her dream job of her dream promotion. It's called a marriage. Marriage is not about you and your goals and your ambitions. Marriage is about dying to your own selfish needs and desires. And it's about both of you dying to yourself to do what's best for the marriage, what's best for the family. And this is a complete disgusting example of what not to do in a marriage. But of course, they hail it as the good thing that she did. And then, of course, there's the typical normalization of porn where all these mommies get together and their mommy group with their babies and talk about the kind of porn they like to watch. And how, you know, the porn gives them good ideas as to sex noises to make. And then talking about their fetish, we're watching anime, animated porn. It's just disgusting because that is not healthy. We have talked about porn in depth and that is not healthy for human beings, for their mental state, whether you're single or married. It is very dysfunctional and has chemical repercussions. There's a reason why the states, there's various states in the United States declaring porn a public health crisis. It is by medical professionals declaring and giving you the backup science behind this being a crisis. This is a problem. And so continuing to normalizing in, in the media is just disgusting. And then last but not least, among the many, many more crap sandwich that this show was, there's one character who she, her husband stays at home with the baby, which is fine. And she works. And they have their various issues, but then she decides she's unhappy in the marriage. So, of course, it totally normalizes and praises her for sowing her wild oats. And she goes and cheats on her husband. And she's just because she's unhappy in the marriage. Unhappy? Unhappy? Lots of people are unhappy. First of all, marriage is not even about happiness. Marriage is about commitment. If you're unhappy in your marriage, you work through it. But on top of that, normalizing and praising her cheating on her husband? Uh-uh, that's wrong no matter what. I understand rough marriages. Trust me, as a married person myself, as someone who has watched married people around me go through brutal times in their marriage, it doesn't matter. You don't praise and normalize flippantly flirting and cheating on your spouse. Oh, and before that, and of course, the way she gets her, her, her boss's um, attention, who is not her spouse, is it, it shows her masturbating in the office while she's pumping breast milk. So, I mean, dysfunction on top of dysfunction on top of, on top of sluttiness. So there you go. That's that deconstruction, true horribleness on Netflix. I believe it's a next Netflix original called Working Moms. And it's basically, they should call it leftist moms or dysfunctional leftist moms or moms who are not doing it right. I mean, any of the above titles would work just great. But truly, truly disappointing that this is the kind of trash that we're promoting as acceptable and good and praiseworthy. So we're going to go over a couple of questions and then we will do good in the world. Good in the world. Oh, sorry, questions. Greg asks, louder with Crowder mug or leftist tears tumbler? Bro, both, obviously. Olivia asks, 
did your mom remarry after you guys left? Okay, so backstory for those of you listening for the first time or have not read my Instagram page, I talk about this a lot, um, so it's not an uncommon subject. My mom left my polygamous father. She was one of seven wives. I think she was his, I know she was his fifth wife. She left that when I was a little girl and escaped that. And I tell that story a couple of different posts on Instagram and probably in my podcast at some point or another. Um, yes, my mother did remarry. She remarried when I was, I was, hold on, let me think about this. I was eight years old. Yeah, I was eight years old when my mom remarried and she married to the best guy ever. He's amazing. He is the man I call dad. I believe that being a dad is not about the DNA you share. Being a dad is actually an action. Being a dad is a role and my dad did fill that. He is my dad in every sense. He's the one who helped me with my homework. He's the one who, you know, scared off the boys, you know, as a teenager. He was the one who supported my mom, who was there every night, who tucked us in. He was my dad. He was the one who walked me down the aisle and gave me away to my husband when I got married. So I love, love, love my dad. And I talk about that too on Instagram. So check that out if you want to find that backstory. Maybe I'll make some stories or something so this can be easily found because I get a lot of questions like that. So, Olivia, that's the answer to your question. Jess asked, do you find yourself feeling cynical of current events? How do you turn that into something productive? Yes, sometimes I do find myself feeling cynical of current events. Excuse me. And that is usually when I turn the news off. I turn the news off and I take a break and I detach because there's while it's good to be up to date on what's going on in your country and what's going on in politics, there's also a certain point when you need to unplug and you need to be with family. I try to take at least one day when I don't really do anything on my phone. And yeah, I lose, I, I don't, I have to get caught up on the, on the news after, but I am able to detach and remember what really matters. And really the only thing that truly matters at the end of the day in this world is relationships, specifically your relationship with God and your relationship with your loved ones around you. It's not about how many Facebook followers you have. It's not about how many Instagram followers you have. It's not about how many likes you got on your last photo. It's not about how much news you have, you know, listed in your brain of current events. At the end of the day, what really matters is the relationship with your loved ones and your relationship with God. So I would really recommend taking at least one day to disconnect from everything and being very intentional. Maybe put your phone on do not disturb for that whole day and just let your close, you know, like your extended friends and family just say, hey, just, you know, every week on this day, I turn off my phone and put it on do not disturb. If it's an emergency, you know, maybe, you know, put them on a favorites list or if they call three times, they'll get through or something. But whatever it is you decide to do, I, I strongly recommend you take a break from all media at least once a week. It's, it's just kind of a reset on life and helps you to remember what's really important. Um, and then the last part of that is how do I turn that into something productive? Um, I turn into something productive by, by taking any frustration I have and reminding myself to go to the Bible. When I have questions, when I have cynicism, when I have, you know, maybe a doubt, Debbie Downer kind of feeling about my country, I bring it back to God. That's when I pray. That's when I read my Bible. It's my reminder that I need to spend more time in his word. So that's how I kind of turn that in, around. For good in the world, this is actually one I'm pretty excited about in... Oh my goodness, I'm looking for it. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I lost it. Oh, maybe I'll just have to do it from memory. I feel like I lost the article. Uh, essentially, I'm really excited. Ohio had a ruling on their sixth court, kit, I believe, and they essentially made it clear, they made a ruling that Ohio can defund Planned Parenthood, and they found that loophole, and that is really exciting to me because every single week it feels like there are more and more beautiful stories about how patriots are finally breaking through they're finally making a difference and in utah we you know we pass a, um the fetal heartbeat or the fetal pain bill and it's just it, i just i don't want us to lose sight i don't want us to lose sight of the fact that abortion right after Roe versus Wade, and, and you know the people who are you know, a generation above me will remember this everyone felt like it was the end of the road. Roe versus Wade happened. All of a sudden, you know, abortion was wide open, but it took people who had vision to fight for over 46 years till today to continue fighting that, to never accept that as the end of the road. And I just want to remind you that we can win long-term, even here 
in America, we can win in our lifetime if we just fight hard enough and we have the stamina. And I feel like that stamina comes from God and our faith and our community, but we can fight through. And I just want to remind you that the same has to do with same, with same sex marriage. You know, we can't take that ruling as the end of the road. Oh, it's legalized. It's, you know, went through our Supreme court. No, it can, we can see the same kind of turnaround that we're seeing with Roe versus Wade, how people thought it was the end of the road, you know, 46 years ago. But look at us today. Look at the, the progress we're making today. Look at the turnaround. Look at the, the vocalness. Look at the conversation that's forefront in people's brain. You can't escape even learning that. It's coming to the point now where it is so widely talked about it that I believe that there will be a day when people can't say, I didn't know. Because education will be everywhere. You turn around and it's there and people can't say, they didn't know. And so I have so much hope for the pro-life movement. I'm so excited about all the wonderful good things that are happening and the progress that's being made. And it has to do with the people, the generation before me, my mom and my grandma's generation deciding, no, Roe versus Wade is not the final say. We're going to push forward. Even if it takes us, you know, 40 plus years, we're going to see this reverse. We're going to see the American public aware of what this is. And you know what? My goal isn't just to make abortion illegal someday, but I want to make it unthinkable someday. So there's not even the, what the leftists will say, the back alley abortions with coat hangers. I want it to be unthinkable because people will know the facts. The pro-abortions, abortionists will know the facts. They will know what it is so that for the most part, it's unthinkable. So that's my good news. That's my good news for the world. I don't want us to forget that we can win and that God is on our side. And that is at the end of the day, that is what matters. Thank you so much for joining. If you love this, please subscribe, leave a review. Even if you don't want to like type a long review, just hit five stars, leave five stars, and that will mean the world to me. And if you're feeling super encouraged and extra enthusiastic, please write some nice words and I'll read them and, and I'll share them and that would be lovely. So have a beautiful rest of your day. God bless you. God bless America.